Ephesians 6, verse 10. The Apostle Paul, speaking to the church at Ephesus, he says this. Finally, be what? Be strong. Underline verse 10, because we're going to circle back to this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, because of that, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil, and having done all of this, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In how many circumstances? In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you may extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the what? The word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. If you've been in the military, if you've served our country, World War I, World War II, Korea, uh, Vietnam, any of the current wars we've had overseas, you know when you're at war. You know, nobody has to tell you when you're on the battlefield or when you're in Baghdad, I think we might be at war. No, you know you're at war. You want to know why? Because somebody's trying to shoot at you. Because somebody planted a bomb in the ground that they're hoping you drive over or step on. So watch, what that does to your psyche, what that does to your mentality is, I'm at war. Every day, even when you're on the battlefield, when you lay down to sleep, you don't really sleep. Because in the back of your mind, you're like, always on alert. So for those of us that have served our country or have been in any kind of scenario like that, nobody has to tell you or warn you, hey, you might be on the battlefield because you're already on it. You're at war. You know you're at war. You're on alert in your mind and in your heart because you know somebody's trying to do you wrong. Somebody's tr when somebody's trying to kill you, you know it. No one has to send you a letter or text you, hey, you might be in peril. Because you know you are. We have a modern term called PTSD, which if you've been on the battlefield or you've been in a hyper-stressful situation, that situation can bleed over to other later situations that if you hadn't gone through that stressful situation, you would have dealt with it differently. But because you were under so much stress, now you've dealt with it differently when stress pops up later in your life. The reality of war is that you're at battle. You go to war to win. You don't go to war to lose. And this morning, we're going to talk about a part of your identity that you may have never considered. This might be the most applicable week of all the weeks that we've looked at identity. Because this is something that you will deal with for the rest of your life. That I will deal with for the rest of my life. This is the application of identity this morning. Number one, I am at war against my flesh. I am at war against my flesh. This is something you might not realize, but like cancer that kills you from the inside, your body physically literally goes to war against itself. Your cells, which used to be healthy, when cancer happens, the cancerous cells look for other cells to host cancer in. So what used to be healthy now has become poison in your life. Your cells have become Benedict Arnold to your own body. In the way Benedict Arnold was a traitor to the United States early in its history, 
Your cells now have gone to war to kill you. That your cells have decided, I would rather live as a cell that has cancer than live to not live at all and kill this body. The cancer would rather live inside of you and kill your own body than to not live at all and die to itself. It's part of what makes cancer so horrible is that it never goes away. You have to go kill it. You have to cut it out. You have to put your cancer to death or else cancer comes to get you. Literally, in chemotherapy, you try to go to war against your own flesh so that your flesh doesn't kill you. And this morning, we're going to take a look at something spiritual in the same vein. That you go to war against yourself. There's a reality where your flesh, I'm not talking about flesh and bones. When the Bible speaks of flesh, it doesn't say your body's bad. Your body's good. Your body's been given by God. Your body is a gift to you from God. Your actual flesh flesh, this flesh is good. There's nothing wrong with this flesh at all. It's a gift from God to you. It's a, your body's a masterwork of 12 systems that work together. Biologically, it's a miracle that your stomach doesn't just dissolve itself with the acid that's inside of it. Hydrochloric acid will kill you if you drink it. But it exists naturally inside your stomach with the miraculous lining that keeps it from going all the way through you. Your body is an induplicable piece of masterwork from God. But understand this. When the Bible speaks of the flesh, it speaks of the fact that your body does things against God. So when it talks about the flesh, it means it's the interior motivator that pushes this flesh to do fleshly things against God. It's the idea that you know what you want to do, which if you're a follower of God is please God. But your flesh says, I don't want to do that. It's the war you have every time when porn comes up on your computer. And you go, I know this is wrong, but I'm so drawn to it. Or when that guy at work and you're a married woman comes on to you and you love the attention, but you know, this is totally wrong. It's the kind that you feel when you're eating at Thanksgiving and you go, I should really stop. <laughs> Pass the potatoes. It's the kind of thing when you're overeating and you go, I should stop, but I'm going to have one more. It's the kind of thing when you go, I know our bank account. I can't afford this 14th coach purse this month. But you still pull the card out and you go, shlink. And as the card is swiping through there, you're, you're going, I should not be buying this. I really should not be buying this. Shlink. It's the idea that you know one thing, but you do another. You go to war against yourself, and you have been given a conscience. Science can't even find a conscience. My father was a biology professor. My whole life, I grew up seeing the biology of how God built the body. But the funny thing is that science can't find the conscience, yet our whole legal system is based on the fact that you knew you were wrong. You went and did something that you knew was wrong, and now we're going to put you in jail. Our whole legal system isn't even based off of physical. It's based on the fact that you went and did something that was wrong. Dogs don't have legal systems. Roaches don't take each other to court. <laughs> you ate that piece of bacon that fell on the floor that was mine. Roaches don't even fight. They just crawl over and die, praise God. <laughs> the reality is that humans have a conscience which tells us, don't do that, do, do not do that. It's a gift from God that tells you, you're going to displease me if you do this thing. Don't eat that much. It's gluttony. Don't spend that much. It's materialism. Don't have sex with her. You're already married. Don't flirt with him. You already are married. It's the idea that God, God's gift to you is don't. Don't. Not because I hate you, because I love you. I give you a guiding principle inside of your own heart and mind. Don't take your flesh somewhere where your fleshly spirit pushes your body to do something to dishonor God. 
You are at war all the time in your flesh. And it's, a, it's so obvious, we feel it every day. It's that check inside of your mind. Don't, 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 nope, nope. <laughs> it's that thing that goes, nope. And we go, yeah. You are at war against your own self. I want to make that clear. It's not neutral. Your, you, your soul is not neutral to God. If you've ever had a baby, if you're a parent, or you've ever worked in our nursery, or our preschool, or our children's ministry, or our middle school, or our high school, or our college ministry, or if you've ever been an adult, <laughs> you, that encompasses everyone. <laughs> if you've ever dealt with people, especially children, you realize that part of, the hardest part of parenting is to get your kids to not focus on themselves. You have to, it takes effort to teach your daughter, please don't go through my closet and take whatever you want. That jewelry, my 13-year-old daughter, is worth more than your life right now. <laughs> so please don't wear that to the eighth grade dance. My son, if you ever get in my vehicle and drive it again, you will be walking the whole rest of your life. We have to teach children to not be self-focused. Because it's so part of our nature, the minute you're born, you're about self. You're about flesh. You're about what do I want? What will make me happy right now? It's so innately a part of us that we can't get away from it. I want to, I want to lay that foundation. You're at war against your own self. You're not neutral. Don't think I'm neutral. You're not neutral. If you were neutral, you wouldn't even have needed conscience. But God builds it inside of you to help you and me. Humans are born in the image of God with a nature corrupted by sin, leading to sinful actions from a self-orientation. While people assume their feelings are pure and true to them, people are self-deceived until they come to the light of Christ John 8, 12, Jesus says this beautiful verse. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus doesn't say, I am one of the lights. There's plenty of lights out there, and if you just happen to follow me, cool. Jesus doesn't say, Buddhism, which came before him, is, 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 is a light. Or Allah, through the Quran, which is coming in 600 years after me, that will be a light to you too. Or, forget all religious mumbo-jumbo, look inside your heart. Listen to your heart <laughs> when he's calling. Okay, anybody rock set? 80s? No? Okay. All the young people are like, what is that? Look it up. <laughs> Understand this. You don't look, watch, you don't look outside for other people's ideas, other men and women's ideas to give you light. You don't look inside in your self-help books that don't help yourself. You don't find light inside and you don't find light outside. You find light through Christ because Christ is God, not a man, not a religious figure. He is God himself, so he is able to give light not a construct of religion, but actually God himself. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will not wander around in darkness, but will have the light of life. I was just in Big Bear this last week, and where I was staying had no streetlights. And it was overcast for a couple of days. And I remember uh, I went out in the backyard it was like midnight, because I like to look at the stars. And I went out there, and I'm like, oh, there's no stars. So I walked out on the deck, and I shut the door behind me. And I went out beyond the gate where this cabin was. And it was pitch black. I mean, it was like, it was like I was looking through oil. It was the kind of black that happens when you go outside, and you go like this. Because your eyes are trying to like absorb as much light as you can to get some depth perception. It was literally dark, dark. It was literally like I was blind dark. And then I started to think, this, this, 
This fear crept into my heart. And you know what it was? The fact that Big Bear was named Big Bear. (laughs) And here's the reason that was sketchy. Because I'm outside going, I am absolutely defenseless. I don't know what's in front of me. I hardly know what's behind me. Literally, a bear could be sitting five feet away just waiting for, look at this, white guy's going to be a snack. (laughs) It was so dark, I literally could have walked into the bear's mouth and I wouldn't have known it. Fear came over me. You want to know why? Because I didn't know what I was doing or where I was going. I had no ability to know anything about my life at that moment as far as where I was. Nothing gave me greater pleasure than when I got back inside and there was light and I could shut that door. And a bear who was not given opposable digits by God could not open the door and come inside. And so I'm inside in light and in warmth. And you know what? That gave me security. You want to know why? Because I could see what was going on with my life. Spiritually, it's the same thing. If you don't have Christ, you think you have sight. You think in the, every blind person, if everybody was blind around the world, they'd go, I have sight. But a person who has sight will let you know you don't have sight. In the darkness, everything's the same. Everything's the same. But the problem is, is when I walk in the darkness, I stumble and fall and I break myself. And the sad part is because I have no discernment, because there's no light, I don't know why I hurt myself. I'm just broken. I stumble in the dark and break my leg. But because I'm in the dark, I have no idea why that even happened. You want to know why? Because there's no distinction in my life. There's no light. Before I came to know Jesus, I was all darkness. But I thought I knew what I, talk, what I was talking about. I thought I had light in my life. I was educated. I was a pretty smart guy. And I thought, you know what? I don't need religious stuff. I just need to get along in life. I'll make some money. Marry a beautiful woman, I'll be cool. But what happened to me was that when Jesus came into my life, he literally opened my spiritual eyes and I had light. And here's the point how it works with flesh. Before I knew Christ, I continually sinned against God, but I didn't know it. Because there was no distinction in my life. It was always about me. And so because my world was always about me and I was in darkness, every choice was about me. Because that's what I thought you do. But when Jesus shone in my life and he reoriented my life, all of a sudden I had sight that I never had before. And I, I now, instead of going with my flesh, realized I had to battle my flesh. That I wanted to do things that dishonored God. When I was in darkness, I just did them anyway. Because I didn't care about God. I couldn't, there was no distinction in my life. But when light comes in, it gives you distinction. It gives you depth perception. It gives you life. You see color. Life is vibrant, and Jesus changed my life. It wasn't religion. Jesus himself transformed me. And now I realized the things I wanted to do before, I now have to say no to. I had to go to war against myself, go to war against my old self. Humans naturally do not want God's will in their life, so they live by their fleshly desires. Once repentance happens, People are given a new spiritual nature, but that will still struggle with old habits. So if you're in Ephesians, go back a few books. Keep your finger there, but go back a few books to Romans. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. Romans 7. Romans 7, 19. Actually, we start in verse 18. You know what's funny about this book? The book of Romans, it's written by a guy named Paul, the apostle. He was a super religious guy until he came to know Jesus. And then he became a follower of Jesus and his life was transformed. And you think in your mind, so let me, I'm going to encourage you right now, ready? Because I know you're thinking in the back of your mind, man, everything I struggle with, man, it's it's massive. If you knew the things I struggle with, you'd go, dude, you're a wreck, which I probably would, but I would still give you this encouragement. Here's what I would say. We think, gosh, if I was godly, I just wouldn't struggle with this pornography problem I have. If I was godly, I, just, I wouldn't be attracted to guys that aren't my husband. If I was really godly, I'd be a great employee rather than just keep on ripping my employer off. I would stop struggling with all this sin in my life. You know what's encouraging? 
is that's not true. Paul the Apostle, who wrote almost a half of your New Testament, has this testimony about himself in Romans chapter 7, verse 19. Actually, we'll start in verse 18, 7, 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. Verse 19. For I do not the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do is what I keep doing. Does that encourage anybody? Here's the reason that should encourage you. Because it will be a battle against yourself your whole life. Don't think, if I was super godly, then I wouldn't have these issues. Nope. Because a super godly guy says, I got those issues. So let me encourage you from this standpoint. You will have these battles your whole life. But guess what? The grace of God is greater than your struggle. The power of God is greater than your flesh. Your flesh is not stronger than God. Even Paul the Apostle, who was, a, who was the, probably the greatest Christian leader in history, he struggled against himself. Though I want to serve God, man, it's just that draw to keep doing evil. And here's one thing we all have to come to terms with. Ready? You love to do evil. You love it. Just admit it to yourself. Admit it. You, you and I love it. If we didn't have any kind of consequence, imagine the evil we would do. If nobody saw, if, no, if, you, if you were never scared about what people would know that you did, if you had a free pass to do anything you wanted to do, imagine what you would do. You'd go, I'd just be good to everybody. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't. And neither would I. Without the grace of Jesus, I wouldn't love people either because I love myself too much. But watch, it's the light of Christ that makes me love others. It's the, it's the love of God for me that makes me love others. It's the amazing grace of God who's forgiven my sin that makes me want to help other people. It's the ability that God gives you to say no to the wrong and yes to the right. The things that we love to do, we have to say no to because we believe in something greater from Christ. Even Paul says that because the evil I don't want to do is what I end up doing. If you're in Romans, turn to uh, Romans 12, so a couple chapters away. Romans 12, verse 21. Underline this in your Bible. Let this be an encouragement to you. Romans 12, 21. Make this a, a life verse. If you, can't, if you have a hard time remembering Bible verses, remember this one because it's super easy and it will be super helpful in your day of temptation. Do not be overcome with what? evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. Do not be overcome with the evil that is either coming against you from the outside or the evil that exists within you from the inside. You can overcome any kind of evil from the inside or from the outside with the good of God. The next time you're tempted with whatever temptation you have, go, God, help me to overcome this with the goodness of you. Help me to love you more than I love my sin. Help me to love good more than evil. Help me to follow you, Jesus, rather than following my own feelings because my own feelings are going to lead me astray. You can't base yourself off your feelings because your feelings will pull you away from God. Your feelings are part of that thing that goes, I don't really need that. When your heart, you know you're wrong. You can't base your life off your feelings. It must be off of God's word. It is this battle which must be continually fought as the old self desires to come alive again. So there's a part of me, the old me, the old Jim, pre-Jesus, B.C., before Christ Jim, that still wants to do those old things. Hey, gosh, remember? Remember? Like, think about your own life. It's those things inside you that go, gosh, wouldn't it be great if I could just get high every day? I could just say stoned. If you're a pot smoker, you're like, oh, gosh, if I could just say stoned every day, bro. <laughs> or you're a prescription drug abuser. 
you hurt your hip 20 years ago and you're still taking Oxy and you haven't had pain in your hip for 19 and a half years. <laughs> and every time you pop one of those pills or smoke some pot or whatever, or whatever you do, whatever your thing is, whatever your pet sin is, whenever you go and feed that pet sin, it's that thing that you go, I hate doing this. Why do I keep doing this? But it's the part of you that still loves it. That's why you keep your pets alive. Because it's your pet sin. And you go, this one isn't too bad. I'm not a murderer. Right? We always compare ourselves to Hitler. I'm not Hitler. <laughs> Hitler always goes under the bus. Right? If you're in sin, you go, well, at least I'm not Hitler. I'm not a megalomaniac killer of people. And God goes, you know what? You're right. Good for you. Nope. We get into the comparison game to, to justify ourselves when really what we need to do is take those pets and put them to death because they're not really pets. They're rats that carry disease into our lives. So the old me wants me to come back. Come on, man. To come on. Remember, remember that good time? And I remember those old times when I was puking my guts up after I drank too much around the porcelain throne. And in those moments, I'm going, God, I'm never going to drink again. I swear to you, God, I'm never going to drink the whole rest of my life. Jaeger, what? I'm never going there again, God. But then once we're past that pain, it draws us back. Hey, hey, come on, man. Come on. You're 20 years old. Don't give your heart to God, man. He's going to take away all your fun. What's your problem? When you get to be old and crusty, like 40, you can do stuff like that. <laughs> you're, you're 20 years old, man. You can throw your life away. Go have some fun. Man, save that religious -y stuff for when you get old and crusty and you can't have fun. Everything will draw you back to the good old days. But guess what? Those good old days weren't that good. Because that's why you left them. So we battle against our flesh. Even when we get saved, our old self goes, come on, come on. We have to learn to say no even to ourselves for the sake of the goodness of God. Instead of conforming to the old way, believers are to choose the transforming power of God so their character is strengthened to do God's will. Character is built on doing good, not on what? On feeling good. Your character will never be built well if you build your character on your feelings. Your feelings are like the waves of the water that change. But when you do the right thing in front of God, you feel solidity in your life. Like I'm gaining mastery over myself. There's nothing worse than feeling like you're your own worst enemy. But when you can gain mastery over yourself by saying no to the wrong and yes to the right... You say no to evil and yes to good. You say no to self and yes to Jesus. You will feel like you're standing on a rock because you will have control in your life rather than lack of control. Number one, I'm at war against my flesh. Number two, I'm at war against the world. I'm at war against the world. And this may be a little bit different than what you think it is. As sinful people make sinful cultures, and then sinful nations, God allows their influence to pervade our daily life. Once the believer is saved, they leave the system that they participated in and become an agent of godly change, though they'll probably be hated. So I want to make this point. Cultures are made up by people. People make the culture that you live in. So Southern California has its own little funky culture. If you live in San Francisco, it has its own little funky culture. If you live in Oregon, it has its own little funky culture. If you live in Seattle, it has its own little funky culture. I've gone up and down our coast. It's funky. <laughs> yeah. And here's the thing. Cultures are, by themselves are not bad. But here's the, you know when you go into a place, you feel something. You feel what's important to the people that live there. Maybe it's the environment. Maybe it's driving a nicer car. Maybe it's having a bigger house. 
You feel the culture that's in that place. And watch, cultures are built by people. If people are self-focused like we all are, the things that are important to them become important to that area. That's what a culture is. So sinful people make a sinful culture, and all these sinful cultures together make a sinful nation. So when the Bible talks about being at war against the world, it's not talking about like World War III, everybody shooting each other. It's about the idea that you feel the battle of cultures and nations in your own life. So I can give you an example. So if you, anybody Facebook? Any Facebook people? Where's my FB people? Okay, a good chunk of us are on Facebook. Right next to you have a news feed. Now watch. It's not all the news in the world. It's chosen pieces of news for you to read, right? So the editor of Facebook puts on the news that he wants everybody to read. Or if you watch the news on TV, it's not all the news. It's been chosen by an editor to give you whatever news they feel is appropriate for you to watch. Here's the thing. In our world, when we talk about battling the world, really, it's the fleshes of other people, what they think is important, they present to you, and they want it to be important to you. So when we talk about the world, it's just other people like me and you, that if you're not regenerated, you go, these are the things that are important, please think they're important too. So when something comes up in my Facebook feed or is on the news, and I know it goes against God's word, I don't go, oh, because 58 other people think it's right, then I guess I should think it's right too. I take everything that I think back to scripture. You want to know why? Because in the same way that your feelings will deceive you, if your feelings are trying to impress upon me something that's important from your standpoint, your feelings will deceive me too. If it's not based on scripture, it has no foundation. It's just people's feelings. It's why, Nazi, it's why the Nazis put, together, put to death 17 million people, homosexuals, uh, handicaps, people that, uh, white people, black people, people that they felt like weren't of value. You want to know why? Because that culture, that sinful culture, influenced a whole sinful nation. And the whole nation went to war against people, and people are dead today because they went with what they thought was correct for that culture. But guess what? It, wasn't, it didn't line up with Scripture, if they would have went with scripture, there'd be millions of people still living today. So the point is, you can't just go with culture. You can't just go with what's popular. You have to go with what God's word says. Everybody understand me? So when we talk about war with the world, we're not talking about World War III. We're talking about the fact that there's a culture that tries to get you to be influenced. And you have to be, all culture is not bad. Hot dog on a stick is part of our culture. And I say, praise God. Every time I have a batter dip dog with some lemonade, I go, thank you, Jesus, that you allow us to eat pork. <laughs> Everybody with me about the okay, hot dogs? Okay, good. You don't want to know what's in a hot dog, but just enjoy it for what it is. <laughs> so all, what I'm not saying, here, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying all culture's bad. Let's go hunker down uh, somewhere out in the woods and live around oak trees, even though that would be beautiful. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, Sometimes culture, if it's not following God's word, will try to lead you astray. I love culture. I love it. But I don't love it when it draws me away from God. And I have to be discerning about the things I hear and see. Because I don't want to go with my feelings. My feelings will lead me astray. But God will never lead me astray because he loves me. And he wants the best for me. I'm at war against the flesh. I'm at war against the world. And lastly... I am at war against the devil. I am at war against the devil. So go back to Ephesians 6. Verse 10 says, Finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. What's interesting there is that the word for devil is diabolos in Greek. It's the word we get diablo, which is devil. But we also get an English word called diabolical, which means that Something's going on in the background to deceive you, or somebody's lying about you. Somebody's doing something diabolical in the background, trying to destroy you. Like you've done a diabolical thing to our company by acting that way. You destroyed our company. And that's exactly what the devil is known as, as a deceiver, as a liar. He will tempt you to go do things that are against God because he hates God and he hates you. But he presents it to you like some glorious thing. Look at this amazing thing. 
He's not going to give you something ugly. He's going to give you something beautiful and go, isn't this beautiful? But the thing he gives you is death. But it's dressed up in, be- in beauty. It's dressed up in what you want. But it pays you back in death. Because that's what he is. He's diabolos. He's a liar, a deceiver. He doesn't give you the truth. He gives you a lie dressed up as the truth. The devil is a fallen angel who hates God and designs temptations to get believers to dishonor God and draw them away. Jesus was tempted at times of physical weakness, yet he always chose God's will for him. So when Jesus went to war against Satan, now here's the thing. Let me, let me make this point because some people freak out about Satan. Satan's one, one, one guy, one dude, one angel. He's not God. He isn't everywhere. So every time somebody says, I think Satan's tempting me, that's technically incorrect. Because say, unless he really is on you, which then you're a stud. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if Satan himself is tempting you, man, you are one godly person. Because he has focused all of his energy on you. He's not omniscient. He isn't omnipresent. He can't be everywhere. So let me make this point. Satan is not, Satan and Jesus don't battle each other. It isn't like uh, MMA or WWE. Satan and Jesus don't have an arm wrestling contest. Go, oh, Jesus, come on, drink some Red Bull. Okay. <laughs> Jesus and God, or Jesus and Satan are not equal. They don't battle each other. Jesus is God. Satan is a created being like me and you. And let me encourage you this way. Satan can never do anything God does not allow. Everybody with me? Satan is allowed to be in your life, possibly for temptation, but never for defeat. Satan will never be allowed to defeat you. And here's the way I think about it. If Satan or demonic things are in my life or trying to tempt me to do something, understand that demonic things and satanic things have no power over you to defeat you unless you allow them to defeat you. They're not stronger than than God. They are created beings like us that are only allowed to exist for a moment. You may be tempted by Satan or satanic things, but if you say no to them, they have to stop. Nothing can overtake you. Do not over, be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with. Evil can be overcome. Satan can be overcome because Jesus is God. He overcomes all evil. Anything Satan can do to you is never for your destruction, but only for your sanctification. That through choosing against evil, you become more godly. If you're stagnating in your Christian walk, it's not because God isn't trying to draw you to himself. It's because you keep on choosing the wrong and you haven't learned to walk with Christ yet. In Ephesians 6, Paul says this in uh, in verse 18, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith which you can, with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. In the first century, um, if they couldn't kill you with, a, with an arrow, which you can only kill one guy at a time, what they would do is they would dip the arrows in oil and they would light the arrows and they would fire them at flammable things, coverings, clothing, so that you would catch on fire. So watch, while the arrow might not hit you or kill you, the flames might. And so what they would do in the first century is they would have a shield that would be covered in a, in a substance that would put flaming arrows out. And so when, they would, when, the, when the enemy would fire arrows at you, you would catch it on your, on your shield and it would, it would extinguish the arrow. It would put that arrow out. So the arrow wouldn't hurt you and neither would the flame. What the flames would do oftentimes is distract. You're fighting and something's burning over here. Gosh, our, you know, our banner's burning or something's burning. It would distract people from what they're supposed to be doing. And so while the arrow is meant to kill you, the flame is meant to distract you. And with the shield of faith, you put both out. Faith in Christ and continually choosing the good puts out all the power of Satan. It keeps you from dying in Christ It keeps you from failing to follow God and stumbling in your walk, and it also keeps you from getting distracted. It puts out the flaming arrows of Satan. The thing, listen, Satan's stronger than you. Satan's smarter than you. 
He's smarter than me. I don't ever think, oh, I got this. Because Satan, it says, is known as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan is stronger than us. He knows your weakness is better than you. Isn't it odd sometimes when you're not even thinking about sinning, all of a sudden, ding, wouldn't this be great? No, that really wouldn't be great. But yeah, it would be. Like you could, you could be thinking about math. You could be doing an equation. You're like X squared times. Wouldn't it be good to cheat on your wife? What in the world is that about? Doing this equation here. She's so lame. Like, why did you even marry her? I don't, I don't. Just trying to finish this equation. It's it's bizarre. It's bizarre how much things go against you wanting to follow God out of nowhere. But you, you learn to take everything captive for the sake of Christ. You take all thoughts captive. You go, God, you gave me an amazing husband. I want to serve him and be a great wife to him. God, you gave me an amazing wife. Thank you for her influence in my life. I love that woman. She's awesome. You take everything captive and give praise to God. Because we overcome evil with good. I don't know how many of you have seen those videos on YouTube where somebody takes a little baby and puts him right next to the lion cage. And the little baby's sitting at this like plexiglass thing going, ah, ah, like this. Ah, ah. And so you got this 14-pound baby just kind of slapping the glass. And you got this 500-pound lion going back and forth in front of this glass. <laughs> and everybody behind, you know, everybody at YouTube's like, so cute. Look at the baby wants to play with the lion. And that lion's going, oh, baby, oh, baby, oh, baby. And the funny thing is that the baby's padding some plexiglass. It's about an inch and a quarter thick. It's bulletproof, unbreakable. The lion has learned over time, I can't get through that glass. I can't get through this glass. I'm going to tell you something, little baby. If, this, if we weren't an inch and a quarter away, you'd be a snack. And this YouTube video that everybody's going, that's so cute. When the lion's walking around with a baby in its mouth, you don't go, that's cute. You go, that's the worst video I've ever seen. And you know what the difference is? The difference is, is that inch and a quarter. Jesus is the barrier between you and evil. Unless you bait it, unless you walk around the glass into the cage with the lion, Jesus is your barrier. Satan can't get through. No evil will befall you when you follow Christ. Bad things might happen. Circumstances might happen. But evil will not come after you. Because Jesus is your shield. Jesus is your protection. He is a, he's a barrier that Satan can't get through. Satan is not stronger than Jesus. Take some encouragement in that. That there's nothing in this world that can overcome Jesus himself. When you walk with Jesus, you walk with strength. Look what lastly he says right here in Ephesians. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the what? I'll leave you with this. In the first century, this is what the Romans would walk around with. If you're a cop in here, this was the 40 caliber, uh, your peace. <laughs> this was the 40 cal that the police of the first century would use. It's called a gladius. It's what the gladiators would use. It's why they call them gladiators. And if I was a Roman soldier, I'd wear my breastplate so I wouldn't get stabbed of metal. I'd wear a helmet so I couldn't get shot with something or thrown rocks at. I'd wear a belt around to gather everything together so I don't have loose clothing to make me stumble. And I'd carry this. I'd carry a gladius. And the gladius keeps people at bay. This is my, as a Roman soldier, my only offensive weapon. My breastplate is not an offensive weapon. My helmet is not an offensive weapon. This is my one offensive weapon. And Scripture says that the one offensive weapon we have is what? The Word of God. When Jesus was tempted, he went against Satan with the Word of God. He didn't say, I'm God, get away from me. You know what he battled him with to show us a lesson in how to deal with temptation and how to deal with evil? is to quote God's Word to evil. It's our one offensive weapon. If you don't know God's word, friends, you need to start reading. You need to start memorizing. You need to start listening to sermons online. We've never lived in a more 
sermon-filled time of history where you could get downloads and videos and everything. We put our stuff all over the internet. We, we get responses from all over the world because it's God's word. It's our one offensive weapon that says, stay back. It's our one thing that says, I'm not strong, but through Christ I can be strong. I don't have strength, but God's word gives me strength because no evil can befall me when I'm trusting in Jesus and the Jesus that gives me his word so that we can follow him with our whole entire lives.